What's the difference between a benzodiazepine and a barbiturate? We'll find out today on Medical History Mysteries. To Medical History Mysteries. I'm Pam Maragliano Muniz, and with me, as always, Tom Viola. How are you, Pam? I'm great. I am excited because I need you to compare and contrast and teach me how to properly pronounce a barbiturate versus a benzodiazepine. Well, all right. So, first off, if you were the boy from Brooklyn like I am, uh, you probably said the word one too many times until your instructor told you otherwise. And that was me, right? When I was in college, I used to pronounce them as barbiturates. And uh, my instructor, who was very conscious of my Brooklyn accent, said, I think you should prescribe it as barbiturates, Viola. It sounds better coming out of your mouth that way. So I've called them barbiturates forever, even though I think there's no real right way to say the word. Uh, but... I did learn a lot about what the difference was between them. And if you've been around as long as I have, again, if you're a more seasoned clinician like me, you remember when we used to use drugs like phenobarbital, right? And uh, secobarbital, nembutal, right? And other uh, barbiturates that had significant you know, efficacy. Like you, if you took phenobarbital, you knew about it. And so did everybody else around you. It was probably one of the, the best... Uh, sedative uh, and, and and hypnotic agents we have. So sedative hypnotic means, you know, in low doses, it sedates you, but in higher doses, uh, it causes a hypnotic or sleep producing effect. And those were the standard for years. As a matter of fact, barbiturates were also used and in some cases are still used to treat epilepsy. Uh, they're, they're great for, you know, slowing down brain conduction. Uh, and in that case, they're probably effective in treating some types of epilepsy. So if they're such great drugs, what happened? Well, the barbiturates had a problem, and that was dependency. Um, you could become quickly dependent on a barbiturate. And in addition to that, they were notable because when they were combined with other drugs that also caused respiratory depression, the respiratory depression of the combination was quite additive. Now, same thing goes with benzodiazepines and drugs that cause respiratory depression when you combine them. But with the barbiturates, it was far more noticeable and far more life-threatening. So we really stopped using the barbiturates for the most part. Um, I can tell you probably the one drug, if it's still available to this day, uh, I would say is phenobarbital. Uh, but I've almost always seen phenobarbital now used in veterinary medicine um, and, and maybe and to treat anxiety, separation anxiety, and, and epilepsy and canines, but I haven't really seen it in humans in a long time now. The benzodiazepines, which I know we're all very familiar with, have really taken over the market, and they are, I would say, the better sedative hypnotic agent. Again, take them in low doses to sedate you and higher doses uh, to help you sleep, but they can also cause dependency, and they can also... Uh, cause issues like amnesia, uh, which some people find very unsettling. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about specifically dental uses. So we don't see barbiturates. I'm going to say this wrong because it's so fancy and I love it, but I'm going to mess it up. Barbiturates, we don't really use them in dentistry for the most part, but benzodiazepines, we do. And we're doing that at a more increasing frequency. For those that need a little bit of say, a little more clarification. Could you give us some of the most common benzodiazepines that we're seeing in dentistry? Sure. And it depends on what they're being used for. Uh, so if we're talking about preoperative or pre-procedural anxiolysis, meaning someone's really anxious, you know it, I know it, let's get them calm before the procedure. We'll do the you know nighttime dose and then the morning of dose. Typically, we see Valium, diazepam still being used for that. Sometimes we see Xanax, Alprazolam, because uh, it's a little shorter acting. And sometimes we even see Ativan, Lorazepam, sort of a middle of the road, if you will, uh, agent used for all of them. Although I think I've seen Lorazepam or Ativan used mostly uh, in that regard. Uh, if we're talking about 
um, a conscious sedation. Uh, then we're talking about the drug triazolam, uh, which we know as Halcyon. Uh, and triazolam is a very fast acting benzo. It's probably the best benzodiazepine for dentistry because it's ultra fast acting, meaning it starts pretty quickly, but it's ultra short acting, which means you don't get much lag after the procedure is over. It's sort of wearing off right around the time, you know, you're cleaning up and getting, getting everything finalized. Um, the problem with Halcyon though, is it can still take a little while to get going. So if you don't have the patient in a chair, you know, early enough, it may not kick in fast enough. So sometimes I've seen clinicians take the Trazolam tablet, crush it up, mix it with a little water and have the patient put it under their tongue to get a more of a sublingual as well as oral administration. And that seems to help induction uh, uh, to some extent. The problem, of course, with Halcyon, which everybody knows, is that it causes this amnesia. Now, there's two different kinds of uh, drug-induced amnesia in my book, okay? There's retrograde and intergrade. And what that simply means is if I took this pill now, retrograde amnesia means I forget what happened in, in the past before I took the pill. Intergrade amnesia means I take the pill now and I'm going to forget what happens over the next few hours. And so a couple of hours from now, I'm going to be like, what was I doing for the last few hours? Believe it or not, some clinicians in dentistry have told me they actually like that idea. And the old joke used to be, you know, how do you get somebody to come back for a second root canal? Make him forget the first one. Uh, I don't know if I like that specifically. I think that there's something to be said for that. But the problem is, I think when people don't have a clear and accurate memory of the events that happened, that can lead to problems like, hey, how I, I thought I heard you say this uh, and I found that insulting or, you know, hey, my clothing seems to be uh, askew here. Uh, it can range in all sorts of uh, different directions when the patient doesn't have clear memory. So I, I would not go down that road. I think Halcyon's a great drug to use. Uh, but I also think at the same time, if you've got somebody that's very sensitive to its effects, you may want to go with some of the other benzodiazepines as well. Can we talk about dosing? I would say uh, when it, when we talk about dosing, especially for a patient who is anxious, but never really had it before, I tend to opt for less is more and go with a lower dose. If I have a patient who is currently taking a benzodiazepine, but now they want to take it for their dental appointment, I usually keep them at the dose they're comfortable with and kind of go from there, even if it's more than I would normally prescribe for somebody. Is that a reasonable rationale or do you have any pearls of wisdom here? Uh, I like the case by case approach. Uh, and I think I agree with you, Pam. I would use a dose that I know they're comfortable with and that they're, they're familiar with. Keep in mind though, that we can't do anything in dentistry without knowing the medical history, right? So we've got to be able to know the medical history. We've got to know everything about that patient. As I've heard me said, and I'm sure you've heard me enough times that you want to vomit, but here it is again, you know, you've got to know every person that's in your chair, almost as well as a family member. You've got to know everything about them as best as you can glean in the few minutes you have so that you know, okay, if they're already taking a benzodiazepine, if they're already taking an opioid, if they're already taking, if they're already using cannabis, maybe that's going to have to affect the dose I use. So yeah, I'm with you. Low, go low and go slow, right? Start low and, and work your way up to see what works best for them. If they're already using a dose, you know, that they're comfortable with, that's fine. But therein lies the problem. If they're already using a dose, do I want to now add another dose on to what they're already using? Uh, or the other side of that is, if they're used to that dose, is it really going to do anything now that I needed to control, you know, other types of anxiety the patient might have just sitting in the chair makes people anxious. So I have to walk a thin line as a clinician. I have to know what they're using. I have to find out where I can fit my drug in if I want to add a drug, if I want to add a drug. And then at the same time, I've got to also check the prescription drug monitoring program for my state because I want to make sure that they're not using other drugs that I don't know about. So that when I add my dose, let's say, of the benzodiazepine, then I'm not really tipping the apple cart. That's excellent advice. Now, I have three other points just from the standpoint of, from a dentist, from a practical standpoint. Number mm -hmm. one, informed consent. Make sure okay. that they understand what they're getting themselves into prior to taking this benzodiazepine. They also have to know, and we have to make sure that they have somebody who transports them to and from our dental appointments. 
And if you have post-op instructions, have them written down. Make sure that they're given them ahead of time. So you sort of review them before they take the benzodiazepine, but then also make sure that either you know they or the person who's transporting them have them to go home with, especially if you're performing a surgical procedure. So it's not so much enough to say, okay, I'm gonna make you comfortable for the procedure. We have responsibilities before, during, and obviously after to make sure that they're treated safely. Couldn't have said it better, Pam. It's exactly the same three points I go over every time I talk about these drugs, because you're right, our, our, our responsibility to our patient doesn't end when they leave the office. And, and sometimes it predates the office as well, office visit as well. It's almost like we've hung out before. <laughs> A little bit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I think you gave us some great pearls. And thank you so much for <laughs> comparing and contrasting benzodiazepines and barbiturates. I'm going to do that from now on. I'm going to lose my Brooklyn accent that I never had and um, say it properly. So everybody for Medical History Mysteries and Dr. Tom Viola, I'm Dr. Pam Maragliano Muniz, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody.